Well, it's getting more difficult to know what's real. I don't know if you've noticed that. It's getting more difficult to know what is real, and part of that is because we live in this increasingly online and digital culture. Like, what, what is going on? What is real? What is authentic as opposed to what is manufactured, right? <clears throat> and we're going to talk about that a little bit. Now, th- there is a part of it which is, you know, kind of people using pictures to kind of manipulate them into funny things. For joke. Like, there's a part of it that is just funny. And a great example of this is, is this picture that was posted on Facebook a while ago. Uh, Jay Branscombe on Facebook, a disgraceful photo of recreational hunter happily posing next to a triceratops he just slaughtered. Please share so the world can name and shame this despicable man. <clears throat> now, the thing that's supposed to be funny about it is that uh, triceratops aren't around. Right, so it's supposed to be poking fun at this idea that okay, wait a second, it's supposed to be funny because triceratops aren't there. Uh, But uh, if people realize that, wait a second, that's actually Steven Spielberg, and it's actually taken around the time I think when all the Jurassic Park movies were being filmed. So not only is it a bit of a joke that way, right, using the props from the movie, but a lot of people started sharing this online, share, 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 and actually believed that this was true and started sharing it, saying, "Wow, we got to stop this. We got to stop the slaughter of triceratops." which was also kind of funny and realized how sometimes we're just not paying attention as much as we should. And yet there's also more serious and significant things about the digital world and not being able to trust things as much maybe as we once could. An example is deep fake videos or deep fake content. It's almost becoming its own type of uh, genre. Check this short little video out. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. So there's just a very short sample. So here's what that was. Jordan Peele created that, trying to put words into the mouth of then-President Barack Obama. And that's an old video. That's been around for a while. Right? And so the ones that you see now are just so exact and are so perfect. Not only that's audio. But deep fake videos are created around people actually moving around and doing things. And so sometimes it's hard to even tell what is going on. There's news stories and there's social media and we wonder increasingly what is taken out of context? What are we not seeing in this? Who, who gets to decide what we see? Who gets to decide who says what in a news broadcast or online and who gets the last word? A little meme was going around a while ago like this. What is the full story? This is from At Success Pictures. And you'll notice that there's someone with a a knife chasing someone else, but that limited view of the camera, it actually looks like the person who is being chased is actually the perpetrator. What is the full story? And so it's kind of a commentary on the world in which we live. What is actually happening? How, How do we know what is real? Scammers are on the rise. Have you noticed that you're getting more of those emails wanting you to click on stuff? Have you noticed that you're getting more and more calls? Well, apparently there's a 5% increase in this activity in Canada right now. I thought it would be higher than that. Uh, 2.5 million Canadians will be scammed through these things this year. And all of this is not to mention artificial intelligence. You know, apps like chat, GPT, or whatever it happens to be. It's, it's becoming hard to know. Did this student actually write this paper? Did this employee actually write this third quarter report on their own? It's being hard to know what is going on. Just yesterday, I was driving through town, and I was listening to 680 News. And there was, a, there, there was a story about a kangaroo jumping down the highway in East Toronto somewhere. Maybe some of you heard it. Now, I don't know what happened. I didn't follow up on that. I thought it was interesting, but I wasn't going to you know, go online and search it out. But the story was fairly new, and the broadcaster on 680 News said, uh, it, what looks like to be a kangaroo, we're not sure if this is an artificially intelligent generated video yet. It was a video of a kangaroo, and they weren't sure if they could yet trust the source Even scientific studies, how we think about them, how we approach them is changing, right? 20 years ago, someone said, a scientific study says, we'd say, okay, well, scientific truth, well, that's really reliable, that's really important. Now, more and more people are likely to say, who funded the study? Who who, who funded that? Who put the money to that to get the certain results to convince us of something that may be on their agenda? And so this kind of, you know, healthy skepticism has creeped into our culture and in our world. It is getting more difficult to know what's real. So with that in mind, we're continuing with this series uh, on First and Second Thessalonians called The Beginning is uh, Nigh. And the timing of this series is very intentional. And so when I plan these out, I'm thinking where we're at in the church year And, of course, Advent means coming. And so we think of the coming of Christ as a baby at Christmas, the incarnation. 
Uh, But really, for the majority of church history, Advent has been a time to think about the second coming of Jesus. His first coming makes us think about his second coming or his arrival again. And so I kind of lined it up so that we would be talking about the coming of Jesus as we get into Advent. And so this and then next Sunday is the last Sunday on this series. And so the issue, part of the issue for the Thessalonians is they are struggling to know what is real. They don't, they don't really know. They've been duped around some things, particularly around the second coming of Christ. So here's what we're going we're to do. We're going to go through the text. It's uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to see what they are dealing with. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take a principle that we learn from there and apply it to our lives in general about how do we know it's real and how do we live in a world in which it is increasingly difficult to determine the answer to that question. Okay, so uh, we're going to open up our Bibles to 2 Thessalonians uh, 2. So just a quick reminder, this is the second letter uh, of Paul. He's the principal author, but really it's Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy writing um, to the young church in Thessalonica. And so these are the early days of the church. This is written less than 20 years after the resurrection and crucifixion of Jesus. Um, Chapter 1 was about uh, judgment, of course. We talked about that. Um, But also here there's there's more uh, focus on specifically about the return of Jesus. What's going to happen? They wanted to know more, and and he's going to give them more details. And he gets into them today in a big time, and so I just want to say to you that today we're getting into some wild stuff. And so for those of you who have uh, studied the return of Jesus, um, the parousia, the second coming, some of this stuff, you've read about this, so it's not going to come as a surprise to you. Others, if this is new to you, you're going to be like, wow, this is... This seems crazy, wild stuff. These are big picture things that are going on here, okay? So we're going to jump into that. I just want to name it. Okay, beginning at verse 1. Now, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, and again, it's a generic term, so brothers or sisters, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Okay, so what's happening? So they're confused. Uh, the word here used for quickly shaken really has the sense of severe distress. So a spirit. So someone's probably been giving some sort of prophetic word in the church or other people have been talking about it. And then in verse 2, you see they've received a letter seemingly to be from us. So probably what's going on is someone has forged a letter in Paul's name, sent it to the Thessalonians, and they're they're confused because he's an authoritative person in the early church. This is like the first century version of a deep fake video, and so they're very confused about what's going on. And the subject of their confusion comes at the end of that verse too, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So someone has told them the day of the Lord, meaning Jesus' return, has already come. You've missed it. Verse 3, let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Pause, okay. So we need to highlight some things because Paul just gave them a whole lot of big information about a lot of big things, all right? So what I'm about to say, by the way, and I just always want to provide this reminder because I'm going to explain what Paul is saying. Some people try to sell the church uh, in the modern times the lie that Jesus and Paul said different things. That Jesus did this, this, though, he's all nice, and he does this stuff about forgiveness, and Paul talks about the apocalypse and everything. No, no, no. Everything that Paul is saying mirrors stuff that Jesus has said. He uses some different language at some times, but we need to know he's passing on uh, uh, wisdom from Christ himself. And if you are kind of, you're like, oh, okay, I've heard that, and I wonder about that. Be in touch with me. I'll send you the parallels. But we need to just know that Paul is saying things that are consistent with what Jesus has otherwise said. So let's provide a bit of a a summary, these four things. Before Jesus returns, the rebellion needs to happen. We'll talk about that in a second. The man of lawlessness needs to be revealed. Some manuscripts say man of sin, but it's the same thing, right? Sin is lawlessness, 1 John 3, 4. Uh, Third, he will put himself in the place of God, for he will take his seat in the temple of God, meaning the temple in Jerusalem, proclaiming himself to be God, right? So this is a very bold, dramatic thing that this man of lawlessness in the context of some wide-scale rebellion is going to do. We recall that old movie, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. This is the latter two, bad, ugly, and big, okay? Okay. 
All right, so what is this? What, what is this rebellion? Who is this man of lawlessness? We are already kind of getting con- confused somewhat. Well, let's take a look, because different answers have been suggested to these very questions. So what is the rebellion? So the word rebellion is sometimes translated as apostasy. Some sort of apostasy will occur. Now, when you think of the word apostasy, um, it's kind of like an internal revolt or internal rebellion. Um, apostates are people who have been you know, loyal to a cause, and then they have kind of gone their own way, and they've kind of rebelled against their original allegiance. And so <clears throat> the reason it's in yellow, and other things are in yellow, are things because I think these are the most likely answers, okay? So if we think in the context of what Paul is saying in Second Thessalonians 2, I think we can deduce that there's going to be some sort of massive rebellion you know, from within God's people, or people who say that they belong to God, okay? It will be revealed that they don't, but anyway, I think that's part of it. What is the rebellion? Some people have suggested that it might have been that Roman-Jewish war that occurred in the year 70. It was a long time ago. It was huge. The temple was destroyed. It's been you know, partially rebuilt, etc. But some people think that I don't think there's enough historical touch points for it to be uh, the Roman-Jewish war in 70. Um, but also people have just said, well, yeah, it is an apostasy. It's, but based on the language that it's used, it's going to be some sort of wide-scale future event. And, and, and I think that is, that is true based on the language that I, I see. So some information, not all information. When we look into the future, especially around things of prophecy, there is a certain fog that we need to acknowledge. Next, who is the man of lawlessness? Well, some people through history have wondered this might be one of the Roman emperors. After all, sometimes an image of the emperor is set up in the temple and is worshipped, and that is really not, (laughs) people don't like that or appreciate that uh, within the people of God. So they have thought the emperor uh, could be an antichrist. Now, there's a word that we hear sometimes. I say an antichrist because the apostle John himself, in the letters that bear his name, say they are many antichrists. So sometimes we can think, oh, there's just one. Uh, But really, there are many antichrists. These are people who oppose Christ, oppose God, oppose his teachings. And some people link this with the beast from Revelation 13 that comes out of the sea. So if you want some really interesting reading tonight, go check out Revelation 13. Others have speculated, particularly around the period of the Protestant Reformation, some people thought, well, the the Pope is trying to advance some laws that are supposedly based on Christ but aren't, and so some people wondered if it was the Pope. Other people have uh, speculated about Hitler, particularly around World War II, and if some of you were around those times, you could could hear those things being said because uh, Hitler's moral evil and moral lawlessness was so evident, people wondered, well, maybe he is a manifestation of the man of lawlessness, especially in the context of a wide-scale future um, rebellion. Okay, so these are some of of the things that people have suggested. Okay, let's continue. Verse 5, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? Right? So Paul's going over information he has told them before. Verse 6, And you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. Okay. So now another factor is introduced. So all this is in the context of the return of Jesus. We have some sort of rebellion that's going to occur, a man of lawlessness who will set himself up in the place of God. Uh, But now, the reason that man of lawlessness has not come is because there's something or someone restraining him, okay? There's, There's the restrainer. Who is the restrainer? What is the restrainer? Well, again, many theories have been suggested. Let's highlight a few of them. Who is the restrainer? Some people have wondered, this is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is active and powerful in the world and so is restraining the man of lawlessness, his time is not yet to break into the world. Some people have thought, well, maybe this is the archangel Michael. Because in some places, particularly the Old Testament, um, Michael uh, is a defender of God's people. Some people have thought, well, it's the government. They might not know this, and no government is perfect. But since, according to the Apostle Paul, that part of the function of government is law and order, perhaps when they actually preserve law and order in a society, that's somehow restraining the man of lawlessness. And some people who don't want to give that position to the government, because people can be cynical about government, I know that's news, but they think, okay, maybe it's the principle of law and order, active and alive in culture today, maybe that is it. And you'll notice that in this slide I have not highlighted as anything as yellow, because to me, I don't think I have enough evidence to sort of make some sort of guess based on what the text is. I think there's a lot of ambiguity. Who or what is the restrainer? Okay, let's continue. Um, Verse 8. 
And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. Okay, so when all this does break out, Jesus will return. Uh, And I think this is actually an allusion to Isaiah 11, verse 4, which is a prophecy about the Messiah. Uh, The Messiah coming and, and, and judging Uh, the lawless, judging evil by the breath of his lips. I I love it. It's such a a powerful verse about the Messiah. And then continuing, verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan, no, no surprise there, with all power and false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Okay, if... That's the negative example. They refuse to love the truth, meaning they refuse to love the truth about Jesus, who he is and what he has done for us, and so be saved. Then clearly what we are to do is to love the truth and to be saved. Verse 11, therefore God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that they may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now this is a bit of a kind of a moral conundrum for some people because how can God send a delusion? That that doesn't seem like God. And so here's some things we need to keep in mind. God doesn't lie, and this is why this is a bit of a conflict in our mind. God doesn't lie. In fact, it's impossible for God to lie, as we learn about in Hebrews 6, 18. We know that Satan lies. Satan is the father of lies. Jesus says so, John 8, 44. So what's going on? Well, this is a situation where if you look around at the language that Paul uses, elsewhere he will talk about people being handed over Right? If people have chosen to reject God, uh, they will be handed over to the consequence of their own decision. So I think Paul is kind of using a similar language here to talk about people who have uh, rejected God and are, and are facing that consequence themselves. All right, verse 13, all of a sudden the mood changes. He's like, okay, in light of all that and it's big stuff and it might sound wild to some of you, here's the implication for, for you, okay? So, but we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. So he's, he's comforting them. No, no, you haven't missed anything. You are the Lord's people. The Holy Spirit is working sanctification in you, which means holiness, right? Set-apartness, distinctness to, to be engaged in his purposes in the world, right, and, and in the truth. To this he called you through our gospel, which is the good news of who Jesus is and what he has done for us on the cross, giving his life for ours, giving us peace and reconciliation uh, with God, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's really in encouragement mode here. Verse 15, so then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the tradition that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. These are people who've been dealing with, they don't know what's real, they're confused, everything that's going on. And so he's saying to them, you have to stand firm in what we have taught you. Don't go beyond it. Verse 16, he he changes finally to to a prayer. Now, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them, or could be strengthen them, in every good work and word. And that's how he ends it. Strengthen your hearts. And there's a specific purpose for the hearts to be strengthened. Strengthen your hearts so given all this stuff that is going to go on in the world that we can just flee to the hills or hide in a cave with our calculators trying to determine the exact day. No, we are to engage with the world as people of salt and light. And so he's praying for them specifically in light of these realities that are going to go on. And you know some information, but not all information. I'm going to pray that your hearts are strengthened for every good work and every good word. And so we end our look at the text there. This is the word of the Lord. All right, so what are the immediate takeaways, right? Well, the immediate takeaways have to do with, yes, Jesus is coming. On the surface, that's the big thing we are learning. Um, He's coming back, but first certain things are to happen. There is to be a rebellion. There is to be a man of lawlessness who is currently being restrained. That's like on the surface, that's, that's what he's saying. But we need to take that seriously as well, right, when it comes to this teaching. Uh, John Calvin, writing in the 1500s, said, Believers, meaning God's people, are to wage a protracted conflict before they gain the glory. Which is something interesting. We don't talk about that very much. Uh, Good things, when Jesus comes, he will usher in the new heavens and the new earth, salt, light, love. Every tear will be wiped from every eye. It's going to be incredible. But leading up to that, 
There will be difficulty, and we just need to be honest about that. And this passage shows us that that is the case. Another place in Scripture uses the language of labor. Right? It's going to be more difficult and more uncomfortable and more pain. Something wonderful at the end, but it gets more and more intense the closer you get to the actual delivery date. But here we're going to focus, and we're going to land on this. Uh, back to the, that question we had at the beginning. How do we know what's real? And the reason we ask that question today is because the Thessalonians themselves are wondering about it. They don't know what's real. What is real about the return of Jesus? They've had this letter supposedly from Paul. People are saying these prophetic words and saying all this stuff. And so Paul cuts through all their confusion and in verse 15 says, Hold to the traditions you were taught by us. If we were using the language we'd use today, he'd say, Don't be scammed. Don't be duped. See, here's the thing about Scripture. Scripture teaches us everything we need to know, not everything there is to know. And that's a big difference. And some of the theological problems that people get into is when they go down these rabbit holes, and it's so easy today because of podcasts and and, and online content and videos and news. And you can go down every rabbit hole, and you can spend all your time doing all this stuff, and you just get sucked into it. And people just, they they put other information into theories about the second coming or anything else about the Christian life as if those theories, even though they're not based in Scripture, are on an equal footing with Scripture. And that's a problem. And so Paul is here saying, hey, what we told you, that's what you need to know. And so for us, the implication is the Scriptures. What we need to know about these big picture things are what is in the Scriptures. Other stuff, what's your response to all the other speculation and the theories and everything? To me, the most I can ever say is maybe. If it's not specifically told to me in Scripture, I'm not going to spend or waste too much time um, thinking or theorizing about a bunch of these things. But let's go even bigger. Yes, there's Scripture. Scripture is, as theologians say, entirely sufficient for us. I want to land on this, and I think this is a good point of reflection for a little bit. How do we know it's real? God and our response to God. How do we know what is real? Well, all of this is predicated on God, God and his word. It's trustworthy and true. And so that's why we produced resources in the past several years. How can we trust the scriptures that this is from God? And if you miss some of those, let me know, and I'm happy to send them to you. So God is real, and our, the scriptures are real, and our response to God is real. One day when you meet Jesus, I doubt he's going to be able to say, I doubt he's going to say to you, hey, you know like all that digital culture that you were immersed in and all the media and everything else? How successful were you at navigating all of that? How, 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 how successful were you at figuring exactly out everything that was going on all the time? I, I, I don't think he's going to say that. What I think he's going to say is, did you believe me? Did you follow me? Those are the types of things he is going to say. And so to that question, what is real? God is real. The scriptures are trustworthy. And our response to God is real. That's who we are called to be. We are called to be people of integrity and of honesty and of love and of truth and of salt and light, regardless of your ability to navigate or not navigate all that other stuff. And, and you should. We should be discerning. We should be, you know, have a healthy kind of you know, skepticism maybe a little bit because we don't want to just believe everything we see. But fundamentally, at the end of the day, our lives are built on God and our response to God. Now, the Carthusians were an order of monks, are an order of monks. They stretch back to the 11th century, so they've been, been around a long time. Um, I have a p- particular uh, interest and uh, affinity uh, with the Carthusians, but uh, that's a story for another day. But anyway, um, <clears throat> they have a motto. I love it. Uh, it has stood the test of time like a thousand years. <clears throat> Here's what it is. The cross is steady while the world turns. How awesome is that? The cross is steady while the world turns. The cross which is the symbol of Christ coming, God's love for us in Christ, giving his life for ours, something we're about to visually and physically celebrate in a few moments. The cross, God's love for us, that is steady while the world turns, while a spinning world spins. All the change in your life and all the change in the world one day, none of us will be here. And there's this and that. There's good times. There's bad times. And and culture does this and culture does that. And some of it's good and some of it's not so good. The cross is steady while the world turns. Friends, what is real? That's real. God and our response to God. And so what kind of a person are you going to be 
in the world. We like to be real. We like to be authentic, sincere. These are values of contemporary culture virtually across the board. We want to be real, sincere, and authentic. Build your life on God and your response to God. What does he say? He says that we should have strength in hearts, Paul says, for every good work and word, which means we are to be people in the midst of this confusing world who engage in good words and who engage in good works. Final word is the prayer, which was for them then, but also for us now. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and hope, good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in what? Every good work and word. Praise be to God. Amen.